Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, John DeLynn, and I'm joined by my brilliant co-host. Oh, you flatter me. Margie DeLynn, nice to see you, everyone. Um, and uh, it is currently May 2nd, 2017, and we are really excited to um, for today's topic. Today's topic is uh, healthy marriage. Uh, we're going to do this as a two-part series. Uh, this is part one of the series, and we're really thrilled to have with us Natasha Helfer Parker, who we'll introduce in just Yay. a second. But before we introduce Natasha, um, we, as always, have a few announcements. Um, before we begin, I want to uh, welcome all those who are joining us through Facebook Live. We've got over 50 people. And today we're, we've got like five principles we want to cover, but we also want to do a lot of practical um, questions. So please start now posting any questions you have about healthy marriages and specifically um, within, a, within a religious transition context. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to do our best to weave them in. Uh, lots of people have joined us. Shout out to Steve, shout out to Julie, Dana, um, co uh, lot, lots of cool people. Uh, welcome everybody. Kimberly, of course, it's great to have you with us. So um, really quick, just a few announcements. Um, things are going well. Things are going great with the Open Stories Foundation. We had our best quarter ever in terms of downloads. Um, really happy about that. A huge part of that is having Amy Grubbs um, and Cody Layton helping us out. So your donations support uh, our staff and operations, and then that helps us uh, do more episodes, release more content, um, hold more events and help more people. So things have gone great for the first quarter. I want to thank everyone for their help um, with that. Uh, really quickly, we have several really exciting events. Um, we are going to be at Fort Collins, Colorado, May 4th through 5th. I think registration's closed on that, but we're really excited that we're full. We, we filled up uh, all the seats, and so we're thrilled about that. Um, so all of you who are going to be joining us, we're really excited to see you uh, in just a few days. Uh, we're really excited to announce our retreat July 7th through 8th in, in Dallas, Texas. We hope that Houston, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, even Oklahoma City and any surrounding areas will join us for that retreat. It's going to be two days. We're trying to get uh, Noah Rochetta from Secular Buddhism to join us. We haven't confirmed that yet, but I will be there. We're going to have barbecue. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to do karaoke. Uh, it's going to be a blast. So, um, that's coming up, uh, August 11th and 12th, we're doing something new. We're doing a mixed faith marriage, uh, two day retreat. Um, we've had uh, mixed faith couples attend our retreats in the past. And, uh, so sometimes our retreats tend to skew towards, um, you know, uh, people leaving the church, people who are really progressive post Mormons. Uh, and so when a mixed faith couple shows up and one of the members of the couple is a believer, that can be challenging. So especially if they feel outnumbered. So it's, it's always been rewarding, but we just thought it'd be really cool to try having a retreat where it's completely split. So I'm going to be there. And then Julie Dazavedo Hanks is, she's a believer. She, um, she attends uh, church regularly. And so um, that will be a split. And then we're going to have couples there where one, one sort of a believer, one isn't. Um, and we think that's going to be a fantastic event. Uh, so please, we'll have the registration information up very, very soon. And we hope you'll uh, schedule those events on your calendar if you're interested, August 11th and 12th. We also are going to be in Seattle, September 14th and 15th. And then uh, October 20th through 22nd, we'll be in Sydney, Australia. Um, and then finally, we're going to be in uh, the San Francisco, Oakland area in November. So those are the events coming up. Uh, we hope you guys will join us. You can go to mormonstories.org slash events uh, to, to check out the events calendar. Um, so please consider. And again, within a week or so, we should have all those registration forms up. Um, so uh, we are in for a great treat today. Um, Natasha Helfer Parker has been with us for a long, long time. She's been a great asset to the Open Stories Foundation. She, she is the founder of not only the Mormon Mental Health Association, which is a great resource for 
people who are looking for uh, therapists who are competent in dealing with issues around Mormonism and faith transition and sexuality, et cetera. That's a great resource. Check out the Mormon Mental Health Association. You can just Google it. She's also the, the founder of Mormon uh, Mental Health Podcast. A lot of great episodes there. We really encourage you to check that out. Lots of topics that are important. Natasha also has a lot of other things going on. So Natasha, we want to welcome you back again to Mormon Stories. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be back. Yeah. Hooray. Yay. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people are already commenting, saying, yay, Natasha, one of my favorite people, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're, we're glad you're here. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of an intro uh, and just um, tell us a few of the things that you're involved with so people get a sense for who you are and what you do. Okay. I'm a marriage and family therapist by training. I've been practicing for over 20 years. I forget if it's 21 or 22 now, somewhere around there. <laughs> and uh, I uh, run an online practice called Symmetry Solutions. And I also run a podcast called Mormon Sex Info. And let's see, about, I think it's about, about six or seven years ago now, I really, I started the process of becoming a certified sex therapist because of so many of the issues that were coming my way. So I would say it was the Mormons who drove me to be a sex therapist. <laughs> and I say that lovingly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's my training and my background and things I'm involved in. I have four kiddos. I'm married. I have a, you know, very loving and complicated relationship with our church. And mm -hmm. that's like probably most of us. Yeah. yeah. And we've co-led retreats and workshops before, and we've had some <laughs> scheduling concerns this summer. Uh, you, you are doing some events this summer. Is that right? I believe I'm doing a retreat with Dan Witherspoon, July 14th through 16th, if I can remember correctly. I don't have a calendar in front of me, so that will be through the Open Stories Foundation as well. And um, through Mormon Matters, his podcast, right? Excellent. And that's kind of about nuancing faith transitions and things for people who maybe want to stay involved with the church, but are struggling to know how to do so in a way that's... Um, you know, self-authentic and mm -hmm. relationally authentic with their important people in their lives. Yeah. So I'll be doing that Great. this summer. And um, yeah, no, I love going with you, John, wherever, whenever we present together. That's always a lot of fun too. All right. Well, it's great to have you back. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay. So for today, we have kind of five topics that we're going to cover. And we'll just kind of hit them one by one. Maybe Marty and I will take turns kind of setting up the, the topic. And then Natasha will have you talk about each topic. And then what we want to do is, again, invite listeners to post questions or situations. Um, and if you're not comfortable um, sharing it on Facebook, we want to encourage you to just email your question or situation to mormonstories at gmail.com. And we'll monitor that email, um, and then we can go ahead and ask. We'll, we'll make sure to uh, guard your anonymity if, if you send that in through email, or even if you, if you make the comment on Facebook, uh, we, we, won't, we won't mention your last name. We'll just mention your first name. But um, we, do wanna, we do want this to be collaborative. So please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com if you have a question or comment, and we won't, we won't use uh, any identifying information if you don't want us to. Um, so that's the introduction. And, and so, Natasha, um, you've put five sort of pillars for this part one of our conversation of healthy marriage. And the first pillar that you have is differentiation. And so if it's okay, why don't we start with that topic? And then after you kind of set it up, maybe we'll talk about it in the context of a religious transition talk about some of the normal ways that that issue appears within a religious transition, and then we'll go to the next topic. Does that sound all right? Sure. Okay. So talk to us about differentiation. Okay. Well, and first of all, it's not easy to come up with topics when you're talking about something like marriage anyway, because there's like 500 different directions we can go. So by no means is anything that we're going to be talking about today all inclusive or that it should fit everybody's 
experience necessarily, but hopefully these are just some guidelines. Differentiation, though, is one I like to start with because it tends to be an umbrella for most other topics. So it's just a good place to start. And the basic idea behind differentiation, although you can spend really semesters and all kinds of time studying this more in depth, the basic idea is how do we stay connected in a system while also being able to respect difference and be able to tolerate our anxiety and our responses emotionally to how people are different from us. We tend to, um, oh shoot, that's my dog. That's okay. I'm that's sorry. It. That's okay. Okay. That's my lovely little dog who thinks he protects us from all things evil and he's tiny. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Anyway, so he, uh, so this, um, you know, as humans, we tend to gravitate towards those who are similar to us. We have lots of tribal type of instincts and there's good reason for that because, you know, we need to survive and in order to survive, we tend to do that better with people who um, are from our same culture, or from our same religion, or from our same race, or from our same socioeconomic class. I mean, you go back throughout the history of time and people have been organizing each other into groups. And it's uh, once you're in that group, it's really important to your survival. However, there's of course going to be difference in each individual within any given group. So different, every system, every group is um, has kind of like a spectrum of differentiation that they've been able to achieve. And usually uh, I give the example of, you know, to tease my own ancestry, it's like, um, you know, maybe Joseph Smith had a, uh, an Italian gene somewhere in there because a lot of the <laughs> differentiation issues we tend to have in Mormonism remind me of my Italian family. <laughs> like if you go against grandma, you know, it's all meaningful and now you're disloyal and uncommitted and you're banished from Sunday dinner, you know, so <laughs> these are kind of some of the traits of, of what we'd call an enmeshed system. It's hard to tolerate difference and difference is seen as threatening yeah. to the system. And so the we is more mm, prioritized than the me. Yeah. Okay. Then there's other systems where sometimes the me is too prioritized, right? And so there isn't enough congeniality or congruence within the system. And now people in those kinds of systems can feel very isolated or don't form healthy attachment type skills, things of that nature. And so that's where the me is prioritized over the we. So healthy differentiated systems are somewhere in the middle, you know, where there is a congruency, there is a sense of we and we are a family or we are a couple or we, even work settings and church settings, I mean, every system has this type of spectrum that you can kind of analyze. And a really great place if people wanna just Google it is the circumplex model. That's a really nice graph of understanding kind of some of the dynamics in each quadrant of the graph that I'm trying to visually promote here without any visuals. So yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can share visuals. Uh, zoom, I probably can. I have, I have no like visuals prepared. So oh, no, it's okay. That, yeah. no, it's okay. <laughs> no, we're good. I think we're good. Okay. So the, the tension between me and we. Um, and I really like that you brought in attachment because um, I've been learning more about attachment theory and there's sort of a healthy, secure attachment, but then for insecure attachment, there's, there's sort of anxious and there's avoidant. And... Um, and yeah, sometimes we can be so fearful, bad things happen to us in the past that we just are kind of unattached and, uh, and don't really form those bonds. We kind of just do our own thing. Let me just ask you, as, as you've counseled with a lot of people in a faith transition, um, let's just say it's a mixed faith marriage to start with. How does this tension of differentiation really start emerging? in in some of the examples that you've seen with your own clients well given that i believe you know mormonism in general tends to be enmeshed or connected system mm -hmm. um it it starts right away i mean it, it's very threatening and when you think about um so this is probably not one of the points i made but another point i'd like to make is when i think about the four intimacies i often talk to couples about i talk about okay so how good are you at your emotional intimacy? How good are you at your intellectual intimacy? And he'll 
shared interests and ability to have interesting conversations together. How good are you at your physical intimacy, which of course includes your sexuality, but other aspects such as affection and things of that nature. And then how good are you at your spiritual intimacy? What I mean by that is shared morals, ethics, sometimes religion, um, beliefs, you know, things around kind of how the world works or how it should work. So if you what think about it, again? I got emotional, physical, spiritual. What's the fourth? Intellectual. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Right. So when you think about how Mormonism is set up from our young men, young women's, you know, days, we're very focused on this idea of marrying within the faith, right? Mm -hmm. So most of us will get that message that you should marry within the faith, whether it's a return missionary or a worthy member or something along those lines and definitely marry in the temple, right? Like that's the culmination of the best choice possible, which requires a member of the faith. And so, um, so much of, I think, our expectations about what marriage is going to look like and the struggles you might have in marriage and just how you project your lifestyle together is very much based on that initial contract of marrying within this construct. And so when one or both are moving away from that construct, that column, you know, I talk about these kind of being four columns that hold up your foundation. That column that for many Mormons was like number one <laughs> kind of comes crashing down and they either forget that they have three other good columns or those other three columns may have been struggling as well. And now all of a sudden you're looking at this foundation and kind of the structure of your relationship from a very different lens. And for many people, even when their other three columns are very good and they actually have a strong relationship, this one column crashing down can really almost feel like it's defining the entire relationship. And, um, and with good reason, you know, I don't think that we've been given skills really as Mormons to know how to manage faith transitions. You know, we don't really make room for that. We don't make room for that as a legitimate choice within our culture. And so there's going to be a lot of fears attributed to that that we've heard throughout the years, whether it's you know, the slippery slope or not having the priesthood in your home or um, not being able to have certain blessings or protections, you know, all the many ways that we've been told that we should be afraid of somebody leaving or ourselves leaving or whomever in the system. Right. So, so go ahead. I was just going to say it's it even before young women's or even in our own like sort of nuclear families before we're ever we ever reach sort of teenage. I think even there we can often feel that sameness right stay in line in the family. What what is allowed what's not allowed as far as sort of um, family culture, but also sort of the religious context as well. And so I guess one question I have for you, because it feels like uh, something that's actually quite unnatural to have this sameness as a goal, like that you're, you're going to be the same and the same throughout time even. So you're going to grow, I guess. If you grow, you're going to grow really similarly and see things from what would healthy differentiation then look like in, within a couple? Sure. And yeah, so we would have that ability to, well, I, I guess, first of all, I want to just normalize that sameness is something we all like. And it's something that yeah. we, that first attracts us to people. Yeah. People are always like, opposites attract. I'm like, that's really a myth. Um, you tend to marry somebody who's a similar IQ than you. You tend to marry somebody even within your own race or culture or socioeconomic status. It's very rare that people vary from those kinds of things because otherwise it'd be too much opposite to make you even comfortable with a certain person. Right. This is true even of our friendships. You know, if you think about people that you really just don't mesh with and people that you do. Um, right. And so it's normal to be attracted to what's the same. And we confuse that with intimacy, you know, like, Oh, well, do you like pizza? I do. Are you from Idaho? Me too. Are you Mormon? Me too. It's like, we're meant to be, you know, we're soulmates. It's wonderful. <laughs> right. We're the same. Pizza, <laughs> pizza, Idaho and Mormon. Yeah, I don't know. That's it. That's, a pillar, for, that's a pillar. It's so true, though. It is intimacy. so true. I think what it, in that moment, what you're feeling is, I'm not alone. Look, you get me. You get yeah. me like nobody else me. gets me, you right? Me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, you too. Right. 
And our romantic kind of westernized notions of true love support this, whether it's romantic comedies you watch or Cinderella yeah. movies, or it's this idea of finding your true love. And, um, and I know that there have been, unfortunately, even in Mormonism comments about, um, you know, that, that pre-existence kind of mythology of there's that one and only that you're supposed to meet. And um, there have been actually leaders who have counter countered that type of thinking. So that's good too. But anyway, so we have this notion that sameness is intimacy. And that is oftentimes what we most connect with is our sameness. But of course, as you spend time with somebody and hormones wear off and, you know, you start spending two, five, 10 years with somebody, it's right. oftentimes the differences that start, you know, grabbing our attention um, or things that we notice that were different, but were likable when we first met are now mm. not likable. So in other words, oh, he was so responsible and always on the ball. And now he's like super controlling, right? Or right. she's so spontaneous and free li loving. And now she's like chaotic and unorganized, right? And so same traits, but having to live with those traits for a long period of time, you recognize right. the shortfalls right. <laughs> of some of these personality quirks that we all have. So yeah, so sameness is normal to want, um, but well-differentiated systems are, in a sense, a, a move towards emotional maturity, emotional intelligence, um, emotional regulation that, in a way, we all, since the age of two, have been you know, slowly getting better at, <laughs> and depending on which systems you come from probably the better or worse you are at that, you know, given the skills that you watched your parents maybe have in their relationships or grandparents even, or other important people in your lives, mm -hmm. including your culture. So a well-differentiated system, for example, um, it's not that you don't have feelings. It's not that you'd be like, oh, you're going through a faith transition and you're going to change every aspect of our life together that we've built. How wonderful for you. I'm so happy. And I have zero f negative feelings about that. That's not, <laughs> that's right. not, I mean, unless you legitimately feel that way, that's not differentiation. That's selling yourself completely short, um, just trying to support another person. But it's more about being able to be uh, present in difficult conversations like well that's kind of scary to me or that's hurtful or I don't totally understand where you're coming from and I love you and I'm committed to you and I think we can work this out and I'm willing to engage and have lots of conversations and um, not you know give ultimatums that are really dramatic or make meanings that are inappropriate around some of those situations so those are maybe a few examples yeah yeah, so I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of two situations that are prominent. One is a mixed faith example. You alluded to this, Natasha, where you really, you really married the. I mean, yeah, you had the pizza and the Idaho, and the sexual attraction in common, right? Um, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, but but uh, we don't prioritize sexual but, attraction as one of the reasons we marry people in our culture. Sorry, we don't? that's a tangent. I did. I, I sure <laughs> did. Um, that's so true, though. I, brother, brother Bro people. <laughs> brother. Um, right. But uh, no, but okay. So yes, but 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 really, for many Mormons, it's the gospel that is that is the underlying contract, right? Yes. We talk about this, and so when when somebody. When somebody changes in a mixed faith context, for example, when somebody changes their commitment to the gospel, that's not as trivial as pizza. That's not as trivial as TV show preference or even whether you exercise or not. That's, that's catastrophic potentially for the believer. Um, and then in the context of both losing their faith, that can sort of be this time of discovery where maybe one decides they want to travel all the time or they want an open yeah, marriage right. and the other decides I'm in a monogamy and I don't want to travel all the time. And all of a sudden it's not just again about pizza and smaller stuff. It's like all of a sudden going in completely opposite directions. And so the question is like, what, what, what happens to Tasha 
when the chasm becomes huge? Well, um, that's definitely legitimate. And I mean, I, I believe that marriages are in constant negotiation no matter what. I mean, yeah. whether you're going through a faith transition or not. And at times, yes, as you reevaluate and shift and change, there are plenty of people who do separate for what they feel are very legitimate reasons and, and so are jumped, legitimate reasons. You jump straight to separation. Well, I'm just saying that's a legitimate choice sure. um, because I think that's what you're saying as far as chasms that, you know, if somebody wants, I mean, there are hard lines, you know, and, and I think every relationship has them, whether we like to think about it that way or not. So talk about um, before separation and a couple's right in that heat of major differences. How do they start to navigate that? So I think that for, before going to that step, I think it's important to slow things down, <laughs> you know, recalibrate. I, I'm, you know, just your, your, the way you talked about a faith transition in general, I often tell anybody who works with me around faith transitions, like faith transitions are brutal. They're brutal, especially coming from a system such as ours. Now, if you're faith transitioning from Unitarianism, maybe slightly less brutal, right? Mm -hmm. But regardless, the more um, orthodox of a religion you come from, the more brutal it is because the more markers there are, the more lifestyle changes. It's not just about belief. It is now how you're going to, you know, what you're going to wear that day, what you're going to eat that day, what you're going to do that day, how you're going to teach your children. So for a lot of people who maybe didn't grow up in this traditional religious homes, you know, they can be a little bit dismissive, like, well, what's the big deal? You're just changing some of your beliefs, you know, like everybody does that, you know, why is this such a crisis for you? But the more orthodox of a home and culture and religion you come from, the harder this is going to be. And I believe in Mormonism, it's quite difficult. So this is what I call brutal. <laughs> and so I highly recommend for people not to make any lifelong altering <laughs> decisions for a good, you know, like year after like a faith transition, like, like divorce, something. like um, starting a, an, a polyamorous marriage, even if you're both on board, like um, writing a dissertation type letter that outs yourself to everybody in your community, like, um, <laughs> you know, so right. just kind of like, just big major changes and moving careers or, you know, or, um, even completely stopping your attendance with church, you know, especially if you have kids who are still involved. I mean, just like, let's slow the process down. And, and I'm not trying or to shame anybody. Or, or even like. Yeah, even some, resigning. So for some resigning may be okay, but for others, it may be so abrupt and extreme. It's like crossing a Rubicon when you might benefit from more flexibility. And again, I'm not against resigning at all. It sounds right. like that might I'm not against right. any of these things. Yeah, right. not, yeah I'm not against yeah. any of these things. Yeah. I think they're all legitimate choices and they're all things that over time we may really get to a point where that's actually a really healthy decision to resign or to divorce right, or to right. write a letter. Yeah. Exactly. But to do that in the in the midst of severe emotional pain and impact and and especially if in a marriage you're really struggling can um you know it can just take people down roads that they're not prepared fully to go, go and unfortunately go cause a lot of regrets down the road as well so take it slow don't make, make big decisions what were you gonna say sweetie oh i was just, i was gonna ask her a question but in the end she ended up she okay. answered it okay. about okay. <laughs> Going slowly is the idea that you actually give yourself time yes. to sort of process appropriately to yourself yes. and your surroundings and to kind of rebuild to a level that you can really feel like you have a read on the situation around maybe values or something to guide you forth versus, you know, acting, like you said, in emotional duress and pain. Sure. And, yeah. you know, understanding that, and I think this was one of my points, I'm probably jumping all over the place, but understanding that the grief cycle is such a huge part of this right. process right. and that the grief cycle involves emotions such as anger and depression 
and it's very painful. And those emotions are legitimate. Like they should be there. You should be experiencing those things. They're just not the best times to be making life altering right. decisions. <laughs> yeah. right. they're, they're good informants. Yep. You know, depression is a good informant. Anger is a good informant. They clue you into certain things or changes that you may want to make. Um, but we want to shy away from, I guess, impulsive decisions or decisions that are based fully out of a sense of betrayal or anger only. Right. So important. Really quickly, Jerry uh, Renshaw writes, going slowly is such vital advice. So we've got a thumbs up from Jerry, which is, okay. that's always good. Jaina writes, I love Tuesdays with Margie. So we're Aww. getting nice comments from, uh, from our listeners. Um, I, I, just before we, we kind of move on to the next, um, I just want to talk really quickly about differentiation. One, I like your idea of going slowly. Something that I really emphasize with my coaching clients is something I call a, a values inventory. Mm -hmm. um, it is, so let's say you are in a mixed faith marriage where one's totally believing and one's not. Or let's say that you totally have had, you've been out of the church a year or two, you've each been on this massive self-discovery and your differences are becoming more and more prevalent. Like let's say one wants to drink alcohol right. and one doesn't, mm -hmm. or one wants to smoke weed and one doesn't, or one you know, wants, uh, you know, who knows, to move somewhere and one doesn't, or one wants to go to a different church and one doesn't. Um, Either scenario, I recommend what's called a values inventory. And a values inventory, I'll just say really briefly, we've, we've sort of perverted the idea of values within religion and within Mormonism. When I grew up, values meant, oh, I don't smoke, that's my value. Or, oh, I don't have premarital sex, so that's, those are values, right? Um, I don't watch our movies or drink alcohol. That's not what I mean by values. What I mean by values is what do you value in your life? Yep. Maybe you value health, physical health and fitness. Maybe you value being very social with friends. Maybe you value being more introverted and reading and, and lots of quiet at home. Maybe you value, um, you know, raising healthy kids. Maybe you value your work and just being a workaholic. Who knows? There are lots of things you can value. Um, and what I've found is for both mixed faith couples and uh, couples who have left, mm -hmm. if you can take the religious vocabulary out of it, right? And just focus on values. Right. What you might find is that even when you feel like there's a massive discrepancy between you, you may find that once you take the religious language or some of the other language out of it, you have more in common than you thought. So maybe honesty, whether or not you're in the church, maybe you still both value honesty. Um, maybe you still both value emotional intimacy. Maybe you both still value uh, a healthy, intact family. Maybe you both still value raising healthy kids. Um, maybe you both love going to concerts. Whatever it is that you value, I recommend a values inventory. And seeing how much you really do share and sometimes that values inventory can can really be informative because if one of you values monogamy and that's a core value mm -hmm. and then another one values like sexual liberation there's a chance that 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 tells you all you need to know about whether or not you should stay together now i'm not saying that has to be definitive but sometimes there are and, and if and if somebody if a believer just flat out says, I want a righteous priesthood holder as my partner who's active in the church and who'll take me to the temple once a week, and that's what I value, and they can't abstract it a little bit from just being a moral, healthy, honest, committed partner who, who believes in honesty and kindness and charity. If, if somebody just lays down the law and says, nope, this is what I want, that can be very clarifying. So sometimes a value exercise can show you you have more in common than you thought. Right. And then sometimes it can really show you these differences are possibly irreconcilable. What, what were we going to say, Margie, and then Natasha? Want to hear I was just going to say, I think in the, with the differentiation model, it works so wonderfully well. Because what possibly can happen is this idea that you're feeling 
uh, a disconnect or all these differences sort of pile up in life. But when you sit down, it's possible to do a values inventory and realize, oh, in actuality, um, you know, we look like we're on really different pages, but our values are actually really similar. And so it allows you to actually accept, okay, it, in life lived, it may look different, you know, depending on who we're dealing with, which spouse, but it, at the center, you're actually very much in line values wise. And so, and I love that with a part of differentiation, it doesn't have to look the same. It's not worn the same. It's not shown the same but it still can be something that grounds you both as a couple. Yeah, so like if we have spirituality as a value, for you, spirituality yeah. could be going to church. For me, spirituality could be walking in nature, but we're both- Supportive of that. We're both anchored in this value of spirituality. It doesn't have to be that big of a deal. Right. And I would just say for the healthiest marriages I've seen, I'll see a believer say, look, my husband's still a good husband. He's still a good father. He still is honest and he's still committed to our relationship. I'm not going to leave him over that. Uh, there are all sorts of losers I could find who are active in the church, uh, but that aren't going to be loyal, faithful, loving, kind, committed people. And they're able to say, yeah, the church works for me. It's not working for my partner, but we share the same values and I'm not getting rid of this amazing relationship. Okay, Natasha, we've been talking for a bit. Yes, let's say. <laughs> we didn't have other panelists because we, we knew we had things to say in this episode too. So this is a... This is a conversation. I love it. I love it. <laughs> no, and I'm, I'm totally on board. I mean, you've heard me present on this. I have the picture, you know, of the red tulip and the yellow tulip field, right? And that, of course, your attention is drawn to the red because that's what pops. And you forget all of the yellow that you have in common because you're so focused on that red. And it's something I do with all of my clients as well, even not just my mixed faith, but my, my ones who are going through faith transitions together, because I think one of the tasks of uh, a, a healthy faith transition is to reevaluate your values and your beliefs and your morals, and not just take for granted that we kind of know what that means, because in Mormonism, we kind of have that given to us in a package. And, you know, if right. you agree with it, you kind of take the whole package. Um, but I think another thing that's interesting in that is that you oftentimes have conflicting values. Mm -hmm. So, and this is where it gets complicated because you may have the value that you want a priesthood holder in your home. And you may also have the value that, you know, of marital vows and that, you know, no matter what we face together in life, I, I value that idea that I'm going to kind of stick with you. So now you have a competing value. And that's oftentimes where things get messy for people. Usually when we're very clear about something, that's not what people are coming to therapy about, right? It's, it's clear, it's obvious. It's now I have two or three or four or five <laughs> conflicting values right. or ideas or beliefs that I need to help kind of sifting through and figuring out. Yeah. And, um, and that's where compromise comes in and differentiation skills come in and and, um, but I do that exercise too. I think I, I maybe do it a little bit differently. I do include people's beliefs. So I just ask them to write down individually of each other, all their different beliefs. Um, <laughs> so they can be Mormon stuff. Like I believe in the restoration of the gospel, you know, I believe Joseph Smith was a prophet. It can be what I call more generic Christian stuff that Mormonism doesn't own like charity or honesty or right. patience, you know, the virtues, um, it's not even yeah. just Christians that believe in a lot of those things, obviously. Right. So, and then I believe, you know, and then secular things like I believe in education or I believe in <clears throat> the importance of recycling, you know, or things of that nature. And so then you come together and you look at these, you know, huge lists that people come up with and they're really fascinating. And then you're like, okay, well, where are the stark differences? You know, if there are differences, like you believe in God and I no longer believe in God, you know, or something like that. Uh, where are the things that we could find common denominators on? So for example, a lot of people will say, well, I believe in the word of wisdom, which usually translates to some type of healthy bodily type of idea. And the non-member might say something like, I believe in health, you know, I believe in having a healthy body. <clears throat> so that might differ somewhat, like maybe in coffee or beer, 
but there is still a common denominator. We both believe health is important and responsibility is important and how we take care of our body. So we have something to work with there. And then you have like a majority of stuff. Usually I've never had a list that's come back without the majority being in common things like work ethic and education and um, being committed, loving partners and being good parents and, you know, things that most of humanity, unless you're kind of married to a sociopath or something like that, are going to agree that are important values. And so now we have a huge foundation for being able to, for example, parent your children or to see similarities in each other instead of only wedges between each other. Um, Like, for example, even your example, spirituality, you could have a beautiful family home evening on spirituality where mom gets to say, this is how spirituality works for me. And dad gets to say, this is how spirituality works for me. And then you invite the children. And now all of a sudden, you've got a really rich discussion and dialogue that I think all families could benefit from, whether you're doing that in a Mormon traditional home or a mixed faith home or a non-faith home. Right. Let me bring in just a few comments and questions from our listeners. I love that they're having a healthy, robust discussion um, in the in the conversation. Jerry Lee asks, can morality, meaning not having premarital sex, be a value? And um, <laughs> and I would say, yeah, I, sort of. So yes, I mean, people get to define their values, Jerry Lee. Um, what I mean by that is maybe, you know, maybe your value is is chastity. Maybe it's self-respect or I, what I'm saying is I don't like to think of values as something you're not doing. My value is I don't drink caffeine. My value is value is sort of the positive affirming thing that you, that you represent. Nobody's going to put on their tombstone, you know, didn't have premarital sex. Right. And so, um, and so I don't like to think of that as the value. It's not as motivating. It's not as full. It's not as rich. But if your value is sort of like, you know, self-respect or self-control or self-worth, and for you that means not letting just any old person have any part of you that they want anytime they want, but instead it's being really thoughtful and careful about the relationships you develop and at what point you enter into sexual intimacy. For me, that's a richer, more motivating uh, yeah. sort of a guide or direction than like the value of not doing X or Y. Um, I hope that makes sense, Charlie. But of course, if somebody has chastity as a value, uh, that's, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, Sherry writes uh, according, uh, about, about values, this is what we told our kids when we realized they were when, when they realized we were out. We still have the same values, family, family, family. Nothing was changing there. We were family. We loved each other and them. We were still together forever, just without the religious language. So Sherry's offering us how to use values within a family context with the kids. And I think that's really Which powerful. Which I love. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. Julie writes, we did this when focusing on what to do with Sundays. We wanted it to be relaxing for everyone and calming, the opposite of what church attendance was for us. We picked what values we wanted to focus on and started there. Charity was our first value, and it was a great start to give back to each other and our community. And I really like that idea of families picking values and then just sort of experimenting on the different values as sort of a way to replace, if they don't go to church on Sunday, a Sabbath, secular Sabbath-like experience. Yeah, and really bringing your children well. into that discussion of what what would a, an ideal Sabbath look like for you? What would it feel like? What would you want to do? And then trying to integrate into sort of a, a values thing where everyone feels represented. It's a great, great idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So again, lots of good discussion. Um, on the- Can I but in on some of that? So, <clears throat> so I think it's important. I agree with your ideas of values and I think it's okay to have beliefs, you know, which is maybe how I would posit that idea of not having premarital sex. So it's my belief that, you know, in order to 
achieve my value of chastity or sexual health or whatever, however you want to posit that, that one of the ways I can do that is to not have premarital sex, that that's part of my value system. So it's, so it can be part of that idea versus, um, mm. and then I just have to, you know, cause I just love to pick on sex stuff, but um, I just have to challenge, like, if you do have more than one marital partner prior to sex, it's not that you're just giving away your body to right. <laughs> Absolutely. Or even if you're, or even if you're having a casual Absolutely. encounter or anything like that. And I know you didn't mean to imply that, but I'm just no. wanting to say that it's, it's important that we not project our own values on or beliefs onto totally. other people's experiences. Right. Yeah. So that should be a value of all of ours. <laughs> yeah. Someone, How do someone, I? <laughs> yeah. And someone may say, I want to, I want to be sexually experienced so that I can bring that into a marriage in a way to where we have the best foundation to, to start with. And so by having experiences that are safe and healthy, you can then bring a richer set of tools or opportunities or fun into your marriage. Right. I mean, that can be a value too, right? Yep. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Um, somebody asked, Charles asked, are there values, inventory tools or templates we can refer them to? Yes, but I couldn't find them doing a, a quick search. Um, the, the values literature comes out of the acceptance commitment therapy um, paradigm. So Charles, try Googling acceptance commitment therapy and values worksheet or values inventory. See what you'll find. If you find anything, paste it in a comment here. I'll also try and do a search afterwards, but that's a great question, Charles. Um, okay. Uh, and Laura liked that you uh, added that thing at the end about chastity and me too. And worth. Me too. Uh, so did we. I think it's super important. So yeah. uh, thanks, Laura, for that confirmation. Okay, Natasha, we, we've had a listener with a question for a long time. I've been waiting to answer it because it really fits in your second point, which is respect and friendship. So let's let's have you talk about respect and friendship. And then I want to go back to a question that was asked at the very beginning of the episode. Okay. So a lot of the – well, most of my couples I will um, – refer them to the book to Go John Gottman's book seven principles for making marriage work oh look, oh, look. we have it right here did they get to see it here I'll show yeah. them <laughs> seven principles for making marriage work by John yeah Gottman. this is a phenomenal book and it really um coalesces all of the work that he's done he's been doing research for years and years and years on couples that go to the love lab in Seattle and they actually live in a little apartment for a few days and yeah. he hooks them up to, you know, all kinds of ways to measure their heart rate and, and things of that nature. So it's really great research. And, and he's done a phenomenal job of pinpointing certain types of communication styles or patterns that, you know, he claims he can like with 90% accuracy say lead to divorce. Right. And so, um, things like, you know, criticism versus complaints or uh, defensive postures that, you know, again, are very uh, instinctual, which is hard for us to stop these things because when we're in a defensive posture, immediately all of our things get triggered as far as going to a fight flight response system. And those things we know happen in nanoseconds. And so it's very difficult to shift some of these around, but not impossible with practice. People get actually really good at shifting some of these negative ways that we relate to one another mm -hmm. and with self-awareness, which is all part of what we do in marital therapy. <laughs> so, um, so those are, are, are really good things. And what he has really come to write a lot about that I agree with is this, underlying idea of friendship and and respect which is really at the basic principle of any religion or you know it's kind of this idea of can i treat you like i would want to be treated can i think about you the way i would want to be thought of mm -hmm. can i uh, respect your experience and your uh, journey in the same way i would want my journey and experience to be respected and oftentimes i find that couples are are in such places of pain that when we're in pain, if you think about a wounded animal, what are they doing? They're licking their wounds in the corner and they're even like, you know, lashing out at people who are trying to help them, right? Because pain is such a, a such an insular place. And so it's like, well, I'm, I'm in pain. No, I'm in pain. No, I'm in pain. Right. And so it's like, ah, instead of really learning how to talk to one another and commune with one another and even give space to one another so that those defensivenesses can come down to a point where you can really 
validate each other's pain and talk about desires and wants and needs and all those things without it being so uh, polarizing, right, right, to either person. And this requires things like we've talked about, differentiation skills and tele, you know, emotional intelligence. Um, some of these things are just hard to come by. And it has nothing to do with how intelligent you are. I think I'm kind of smart. And quite frankly, I've sucked at these things for most of my life. You know, right. So I come from Italian heritage. I'm super you know, feisty and can get very um, upset very easily <laughs> about things. Mm -hmm. And so it's not anything to do about you being stupid. It's just more about um, you know, back in the day when you had to run away from a tiger or a bear or a tribe that was trying to kill you, you needed the blood in your hands and your feet and you ran like hell. You know, now right. more often than not, we need the blood in our brain and that's just not where it's at. So right. our IQ actually lowers when we're in conflict. Right. We're actually stupider. So <laughs> it's, not, it's hard. Yeah. This is hard stuff. And of course, all couples, you know, struggle, especially with something as difficult as a fake transition, which can feel extremely threatening, um, as far as to know how to deal with it. Yep. So true. And I think the trick there too, is oftentimes when you get in those situations of great conflict, you're, there's going to be like a surface thing you're actually talking about, but very often there's something much deeper that's being deeply affected or triggered that the person may or may not be aware of. Right. But also right. so dealing with things at hand, but also trying to get this understanding for what is really going on, on right. a deeper level that's causing right. this level of emotional pain. Which is why you can have a huge argument about somebody not following the grocery list correctly right. when really it's about me not feeling heard or validated by you. You know, and once again, you didn't listen to my needs, you know, and all, but you're talking about asparagus versus green beans and everybody's confused. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So Natasha, we had a, we had a question come up right at the beginning of the show that I think got deleted maybe because it took me too long to ask it. Um, but I'm going to try my best to restate what the question was. Okay. He basically wrote that he, the, the listener, uh, you know, studied the church too much, lost his faith. And he noticed that before he lost his faith, his wife really respected his point of view. His wife really respected things he had to say, but that as soon as he lost his faith and his wife found out, now he just doesn't feel like he has much credibility in the relationship. He doesn't feel the same level of respect. It's sort mm -hmm. of like, as long as you were filling that faithful role, uh, priest, righteous priesthood holder in the home, you've got that respect. But mm -hmm. now you're a disappointment, and now your opinion has been downgraded 60% mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. what, 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 you know, what would you recommend to a couple where one just feels genuinely disrespected? How do they work on that? Well, I, I do think that that's a very normal first response, you know, especially given our cultural context, that wife has been taught that that's supposed to be her response. We do that as an overall culture. I mean, how many of us who've either transitioned completely or somewhere in a nuanced space feel like our credibility has gone down, right, with our believing family or ecclesiastical leaders or anything of those of that nature. So it's part of the cultural context. So I just want to normalize it mm -hmm. um, in that regard. Right. But it is also something that, um, although you can normalize it and even um, quote unquote, put up with it for a while, as you, you know, allow your partner to adjust and transition with you, uh, it is something that you need to speak up about eventually, you know, and be able to assert our own needs and our own experience within our relationship, something that we're not super great at doing. And I will say even further, my experience is that I don't think Mormon men are good at doing. Um, I think Mormon men have very much been given this script mm -hmm. that, you know, a happy wife, a happy life, that she's the one that you're supposed to care for and love and be, um, you know, cognizant of her precious fragile feelings. And unless you've got really kind of a patriarchal jerk who is abusive, most Mormon men will be very appeasing to the wife's needs and will not necessarily know, even have been told or taught how to say, hey, guess what? I have a need too. 
and to be able to do that in a way that, you know, she can listen to. So that of course is a lot of, again, what marital therapy is about and helping people do those things. I am always extremely saddened when I hear that people have divorced or separated or even like entered into polyamorous relationships or like made huge shifts in their relationship um, that have gone south without really being able to access the resources of marital therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll just say it, it was Clay who posted that question. Thanks, Kimberly, for uh, reviving it. For some reason, I couldn't see it. Um, I'll also add that the respect thing can go both ways in the, in the mixed face scenario. Mm -hmm. I very often see sort of the non-believer turn to the believing spouse and now direct towards them disrespect. You're, you're like an ostrich with your head in the sand. Mm -hmm. You're acting foolish. You're acting ignorant. You're blind. You're, you're a sheep. And just really all of a sudden just lower their level of kindness and respect to their partner. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not, it goes both ways in a in a difficult faith situation. And it goes back to this resistance to change, right? Resistance yep. to change. I don't like the ways you're different from me. Yep. Um, I'm super smart and awesome. So if you're not like me, you must not be super smart and awesome, <laughs> right? And so it it is really difficult to to ha have those conversations. And I think this was part of my point too. One of my points is that, Unless, you know, after really since the age of two, unless you're paying for it or you just have to be in it because you're a minor, nobody really wants a relationship with a parent, a teacher, or a missionary. It's not sexy. I mean, unless it's unless not you're sexy. the one that you're, yeah, unless you're the one opening the door and saying, yes, please, I want to listen, or unless you're paying for a class, or unless, you know, you definitely don't want to be married to a parent, a teacher, or a missionary. And it's those authoritative. A, spout, a, spout treat, a spouse treats you like they're your parent. Yeah, in those roles. Yes. Or, yeah, right. or what are the others? Teacher? A teacher. Yeah. Let me teach you the way things are. Exactly. Spouse, teacher, what's the third? Missionary. Missionary. Which Just is let me about, convert it's, it's, you. Exactly. Because it implies I know the truth, you don't. Now that's right. Bring you to the truth, right? Or you're in trouble and I'm all knowing, or, you know, I have something. It's a superiority role right. that we, we want egalitarianism. And, and you're absolutely right, yeah. John, that it goes both ways. You know, it goes from a believer to the non believer and the non believer to right. the believer, for sure. And, and also, it's not necessarily power. Like maybe sometimes a mother can play a nurturing role. And nurturing sometimes can be good, but but sometimes if your partner becomes your sort of like comfort blanket to where it's always their role to be making you feel better, that, you know, sometimes that's your job, right? And yeah. sometimes they need support. And yeah. And I would still say there's other roles that play nurturing roles. Like there's a friend, mm -hmm. there's a lover, and there's a partner. So those are the three kind of contra you know, counterpoints, I guess I would offer to the parent. Uh, Cause even though, yes, yeah, part of a parent's role is to nurture, I want zero parenting aura with my husband, right? Zero. That would be a total turnoff. But I do want the nurturing that comes from a friendship or a lover or a partner that where we're going to have similar goals, where we're still going to care about each other, where I'm going to want to, um, be there in your times of sorrow, be there in your times of pain and be an asset to you. Right. Yeah. That Very makes good. sense. Uh, you know what, you know, what was coming up for me with respect and friendship was when we were traveling to see kinky boots, actually, we brought up a study and we read through this study that was done online with thousands of couples. Um, and I have zero, like, can't cite it. Can't. So. Awesome. We'll just go with you can, the idea. No, you can search we'll just... it and then share it in the show notes. Maybe. Okay. Maybe we'll do. That's what we'll do. But here's the idea that I thought was really interesting that came out of this um, study of thousands of couples that had been married for a long time. And it was that for the first 10 years, communication was super, super like the thing that really was paramount with the couples, among other things, but communication. But what I thought was really interesting, and it kind of plays into Gottman for me a little bit, was when it was longer term, like 15 to 30 to 40 years respect, it mm. turned to respect. And yeah. what I think is so interesting about that 
is Gottman kind of plays with this idea that there are issues in a marriage that are solvable. Some are solvable and some are not. That's right. And with the ones that are not, right, it's how you navigate then around those things. Yeah. But that it's kind of, it alludes to that a little bit to me. Um, communication, you're getting to know one another. You want to understand why they're doing what they're doing, right? But then later on, you kind of have more of that information. It's more like I trust and can respect you and us in our differences and yes. why that might be paramount later. So, anyway, an what do you so an example might be like, uh, and this isn't me, but like, let's say one, one partner wants to drink and the other thinks drinking's bad because maybe they're still believing or maybe uh, they have alcoholism in their family. Maybe that's irreconcilable. Maybe I'm going to drink beer uh, and, and you're never going to like it. But how we handle that, in other words, you know, can I maybe have some rules that I agree to so that I stay safe and that I act responsibly and I don't drink and drive and I have a limit and, and I don't drink too much to the point where it affects my health because we have a shared value of health. Um, you don't have to like it and you don't have to even agree with it but maybe we can talk about it and set up some boundaries in a way to where it's, it doesn't negatively impact the relationship. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. sure. Were you going to jump in, Natasha? Yeah, well, two thoughts, and they're kind of unrelated. But the first one is marriage therapy has gotten a bad rap at times because it focused so much on communication skills, you know, which are important. I mean, it's always nice to be able to learn something like, if I say I feel instead of you make me, you know, that can be right. a helpful thing, <laughs> right. but it doesn't necessarily solve deep marital conflicts just because you're going to learn how to say, you know, I feel. And so that's one of Gottman's points is that it's not so much how you communicate. I mean, that's a part of it, but it's much deeper than that. It's, it's really getting to these, yeah. um, you know, do you have my back? Are you going to give me the benefit of the doubt? Um, right. are you going to allow me to influence you? Do I allow you to influence me? Right. Yeah. These are much more process oriented type things than just what's coming out of our mouth and how we communicate. And oftentimes I notice, you know, as far as the, <laughs> why there might be that difference too of communication being important at first is because oftentimes it's through, if I can communicate with you better then you'll see it my way and you'll change exactly. to be like, I want you to be right. versus by the time you've been married 20 years, you've kind of, that boat has, sh you know, sailed. <laughs> so now it's like, right? I realize you're probably not going to change exactly how I want you to. And so now it's more of a level of acceptance exactly. and respect. And, and by the way, I don't like you changing me either. So maybe I should do that to you, et cetera. Right. So yeah, that, that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Yeah. Now, as far as uh, boundaries, and one of the things that we're all tangent here is um, this really comes up a lot with, I think, the hot topic word that I call a post-Mormonism, which is authenticity, right? So how authenticity becomes a very large value for people who are transitioning. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think authenticity is a great value to have. However, what I notice it doing oftentimes is that it... Um, really, I hate to use the word justify, but it, it causes people to say, well, unilateral decisions are fine because I have to be authentic. Okay. So if I want to drink coffee right. and the church has told me I can't drink coffee and I think it's totally ridiculous as to the reasons that I can't drink coffee, uh, without talking to my spouse, without, you know, really looking at the relational context of that, I'm going to go drink coffee because if not, I'm not right. going to be able to be authentic and I can no longer put up with that in my life. Right. And so I just try to challenge that a little bit and, and being able to include what I call relational authenticity, because whether we um, are aware of it or not, all of us are in relationships and all of us compromise in ways that sometimes are really no big deal. And other times are a bigger deal because we are in relationship with other people. So you know, the classic example I give and people are probably sick of hearing it is there's nothing authentic about me changing a poopy diaper. Right. Right. But I, but there is something authentic about me being a mom. And, um, if I was not married to my particular spouse, I would probably do some things in my life differently that I only do a certain way because I know that's important to him. Mm -hmm. Um, but that doesn't make me less authentic. I have 
accepted those things because he matters to me too, right? So I matter, he matters, there's where the compromise comes and there's relational authenticity in that. And so one of the just kind of um, tidbits of advice I give is to try to stay away from unilateral decisions. And that doesn't mean that you're waiting for your spouse to give you permission, because again, that's that parent role. Right. It's more about, I'm willing to have a conversation with you. I'm willing to wait to change a, a, a lifestyle until at least I can understand how you're feeling about it. And at least until we've had a discussion about how that may affect our relationship and maybe even like to your point, make some guidelines that would make us both comfortable or some exploration periods where we can say, well, let's try this for three months and see where we're at after that. So maybe not an an ongoing decision. Um, Right. Like a trial period. Yeah. Yeah. So those, uh, you know, when it comes to taking off your garments or church attendance or what we will or won't tell the kids or um, yeah, coffee and alcohol, uh, I think it's really wise to include your partner Mm -hmm. in the discussions and not just say, well, I'm going to be authentic and I don't care how you feel about it. I need to be me. So true. Uh, really quickly, we've got some great comments and questions coming in um, from listeners. Some of them are directly related. Some of them aren't. Jesse asks, our good friend Jesse, our therapist is recommending we both seek individual therapy first to fix our individual problems before doing marriage therapy. Is this a normal approach? Uh, I'll wait uh, and give my answer. Natasha, what's your answer to Jesse's question? Well, I'm trying not to laugh at that answer because I know that I know that there's all different kinds of ways to uh, do therapy and I know there's lots of different approaches. So I'm not trying to shame any therapists, but I always find it extremely interesting this idea or notion that we're gonna go off and right. individually work on ourselves. I'm like in what island and in what time frame and with what energy am I gonna be able to do that? without also still being in my marriage or being in my parenting, you know, um, relationships or all the other relationships in my world. So if there's an Island where I can go and stay there for five months and work on myself, please let me know. And I'll sign up. I'll be the first one to sign up, but it's just, it just doesn't. So, so that's not my style. I have heard of therapists, for example, that will say, you need to get sober. You know, somebody's alcoholic, you need to get sober before I'll work with you on this or that. Um, I'm uncomfortable with that approach just because I feel like there are family relationships happening. There's a marital relationship happening, whether that person's sober or not. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't times when individual therapy is very useful and people need that individual space. Um, And I would say in conjunction with couples work, you know, or family work, depending on what your situation is. Uh, the problem, of course, for that, for many people, which I'm not unaware of, is time and resources and energy. And so I get that. I get that that's a difficult combination, but yeah. that's what I would recommend. Okay. So I guess I would just say it's not necessary to do it that way. But mm-hmm. I understand if people are like, I'm just going to work on this piece for now. That's all I have energy for. That's all I have money for or things of that nature. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My response is going to be very similar. I the, the thing I didn't like in the question is do we seek individual therapy first before? Uh, I, I don't know that that sequence makes sense, but it's absolutely okay. And sometimes for me recommended to both have each of you seeing an individual therapist and to be in couples therapy, if your insurance or if you financially can afford that, because let's just say someone's experiencing severe depression. Um, and they're in a relationship that isn't working. If they don't get a handle on their serious depression, it's really hard for them to even be in a place where they can work on their marriage. And so that's just one example of many types of things. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's an anxiety disorder. Maybe it's obsessive compulsive disorder. Maybe it's, maybe it's trauma. Maybe you've experienced some severe trauma that just went unresolved. Uh, any of those things can be their own things that require individual specialized treatment and they're going to be blockers potentially to uh, success. Um, but I don't know that sequentially that's necessary. Right. Um, yeah. That's, that's my 
uh, and oftentimes all of those things that you mentioned like the more clinical issues for people i'm a big proponent of involving the family in treatment you know we tend to be very clinical like okay well you have depression well, but guess what? The whole family is living with that depression, right. right? And the whole family is affected by that depression. And that depression doesn't define that just one person, right? A lot of people define themselves by their diagnoses. I'm like, you're not depression, but depression is living in your home, <laughs> you know? And yeah. it's a little monster that we're going to have to learn how to deal with, right? Yeah. And, and that's unfortunate for everybody. So even though the individual suffering from that diagnosis may need the brunt of the, of the treatment, I really believe family treatment is really important, including kids who don't for understand sure. Exactly. Sure. why, you know, why is this happening and, and giving tools, some res kids, some resources to understand mental illness. So important because otherwise they can oftentimes process that as being their fault. Exactly. They're very egocentric, right? Mm -hmm. So it must be mom doesn't love me or, or dad doesn't care or when really you can have some really great sit downs with kids and explain, right. no, this is a symptom of this. And yeah. this is why this is happening. Yeah. So important. Yeah. And another, and another justification for couples therapy with individual therapy is maybe you are experiencing severe depression, but maybe your marital problems are a, a major factor contributing to the individual. Yeah. <laughs> like which comes and first, if, the chicken or the egg, egg, right? And if you don't resolve the marital difficulties, you know, that, that's what's underlying your depression. So yeah, anyway, that's just a thought. Jesse keeps saying, Jesse loves you, Natasha. Jesse keeps saying that he just Aww. wished that you lived in Utah so that you were on his insurance. And I just want to, mm. I just want to take a second to say there are some fabulous licensed therapists in Utah if you can't do coaching uh, with somebody out of Utah. Uh, I, Jenny Morrow is someone that I recommend. Uh, she's been on uh, this podcast before. That's Jenny Morrow Healing. Uh, Kristen, Kristen Benyon is mm -hmm. fabulous. I love um, Marty Erickson, um, Alliance Behavioral Health down in Provo Orem. Uh, and, and Natasha, if you go to um, the Mormon Mental Health Association, you can go by state and you can find providers by state. And what people wish, wish that you could provide is health insurance on your site. But I think you just need to click on their link and hopefully it will take you to their site to show health insurance information. But right. uh, I just want to tell Jesse and everyone else that there are great therapists who are licensed in Utah or in whatever state you reside, Idaho, Arizona, California. Um, and, and if you're a therapist you. who is hearing this and is interested in being on that directory to please contact us. And also I'll just mention too, uh, Jennifer White works for Symmetry Solutions, which then I supervise all of that. And she's in Utah as well. So yes, there are many wonderful people who can work on these things by no means am I, I mean, so much of what I've learned is just because I've learned it from other mental health professionals as well. So right. Okay, Rick. Rick has been waiting patiently for an answer to his question, and it's a, it's a question that we've dealt with in other episodes, so we don't need to go deep into it. But Natasha, Rick is asking, is polyamorous just the Mormon way, uh, the Mormon way, the Mormon <laughs> way of saying sleeping around? It has been years since I was in marriage counseling, but I don't recall ever hearing my secular counselors using this language. I'm curious if Mormons are more open to these anomalous relationships due to the LDS history of non-monogamous marriages. That's a whole podcast in and yes. of itself. Yes. But is polyamorous just another way of saying sleeping around, Natasha? Uh, no, not necessarily. I, I do think polyamory, it be, right? it yes, can it can be. Polyamory is a big umbrella and there's lots of different terms to it's describe. Actually non-monogamy is a better broad umbrella, right? Probably, yes. Yeah. Yes, non-monogamy. Yeah. So there's relationships where, yes, it's just about having sexual experiences with other people within a, an honest construct within your monogamous, otherwise monogamous marriage, I guess, um, which might be called swinging or, you know, things of that nature. Um, and it can involve non-sexual relationships that are more about romantic love or commitments or, you know, it's, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a whole nother podcast in of itself, but it is, I do believe it, there are some, um, not risks, but like, what would the word be? So if you're Mormon and you're coming out of a, a faith transition, 
I do believe there are reasons why we're talking about polyamory or non-monogamy a lot because there tends to be some issues that people are dealing with as they come out of a faith transition that may or may not be as indicated in other cultures. And one is that many, many Mormons did not have much sexual exploration prior to marriage, right? So many, many Mormons did marry as virgins, or if they did have premarital relationships, that was very much clouded in guilt and sadness and kind of this sinful rhetoric. And so they never felt like they got to explore or have healthy sexual relationships prior to marriage. Um, for some transitioners, this is no big deal. Like the, they don't even think twice about it. For many transitioners, this is a huge deal. They feel like they were robbed or, you know, dealt a huge blow in their upbringing by having missed out on maybe a more, what we would call a more normative um, American experience, right? So, because by no means are Mormons the only ones who, you know, practice um, this idea of, of sinful premarital sex. And then the other, I think, kind of subconscious thing that we all have going on is polygamy, right? And so whether we like to think about it or not, or however much we like to push that under the rug, I think most of us would agree that that thought did enter our minds at some point of our believing marriage. You know, would I be in a polygamous marriage in the afterlife? If something happened to me, would you remarry? And if so, how would that affect our relationship? I think those are very normal thoughts that most Mormons have at one point, whether they're talking about it with their partner or not. And so I do believe that there's a subconscious something <laughs> that is happening in our polygamists. Uh, psyches, right? And so then when you all of a sudden are going through a faith transition and you're able to renegotiate or rethink your sexual values and identity and experiences that you want to have, I can't not assume that that isn't playing somewhat of a role. Yeah. Yeah. I have zero research to back that up, but that's just yeah, been yeah. my experience. Yeah. I also think that repre sexually repressive cultures often elicit backlash. And so because we've all, th those of us, most of us, many of us in Orthodox Mormonism, just sort of like were sexually repressed or sex came with such charge, shaming, limiting, controlling sort of language. Um, I think sometimes when we, when we react against sexual repression, it's, it's sort of in, in extreme opposites. Is, that, is there something to that, Natasha? Yeah, no, I would agree. I think pendulum shifts yeah, are, right. you know, definitely yeah. normal. Same with faith transition. If you, mm -hmm. like I said, I think I said this already at the beginning, if you came from a super, or maybe it was a client I was talking to earlier. Was, I can't remember now. Don't tell us, don't tell us anything. <laughs> it was today. It was today. <laughs> but this idea of you come from like a, you know, you can't watch rated R movies. You can't have Coke in your house. You, you can't wear anything but Sunday dress on Sundays. You know, if you come from that type of Mormon family and go through a faith transition, my experience has been that you're going to swing all the way over here. You're going to be super angry, super betrayed, super defensive. Yeah. Whereas if you came from, you know, the families that were a little less rigid, your faith transition is going to look more like this. So yeah. that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes good sense. Um, so Amy writes, how do you communicate when your mind is full of a new thought paradigm and that consumes most of your thoughts, but your spouse doesn't want to go there and hear it? Um, but we have the same values and can live well together and raising children, but I can't share so much of my inner thoughts. I crave that communication intimacy. That is a yeah. fabulous question from Amy. Do you, do you get the question? Natasha? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that? So there's probably the sex therapist in me, but I'm always talking about like managing different libidos. <laughs> so it's kind of the same idea yeah. of ma managing different intimacy styles, yeah. emotional intimacy styles. And, um, and what's lucky about emotional intimacy styles versus sexual libidos is that you can actually go to outside sources without causing much mm. disarray in a That's marriage, good. right? Like so in other words, you can join a Facebook group or a book club or a mountain biking club or whatever, if your spouse doesn't share the same interests. I would say that this is a yes and approach. You know, it's like, yes, it's valid that you feel this way. And I would hope that you would at least talk to your spouse about feeling this way and that, 
you know, you miss this kind of, you know, intimacy with them and you would hope that you'd be able to make space for that. And also understand that your spouse may not share that same level of interest and that you can find other sources and other areas of your life to, yeah. to get that type of um, emotional need met. Right. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I talk a lot about is myths of marriage. And one of the biggest myths I think is that you belong to me, right? That's one myth. <laughs> the other myth is I belong to you and therefore, and we're going to meet all of each, all of our needs. You know, right. you're going to be the main person who meets my needs. That's another big myth. Right. And that's just not, that's going back to that soulmate kind of romantic idea about marriage. And the reality is that if you're, if you're getting about 65 to 75% of your needs met in a marriage, I think you're doing phenomenally well. <laughs> wow, yeah. That's awesome. And Natasha, I'm going to, and Margie, this comes from things you've taught me as well. I'm going to say yes. And, to your response. <laughs> I think it's totally true that, that, that with emotional intimacy, you can find other uh, sources or resources that, that don't violate the, the core of your relationship. However, I think there's a, there's a real risk to the situation um, that, that Amy describes, because if you, if you've got this, major paradigm shift of a religious crisis or a change in faith or a loss of faith. And then you've got this whole new world view, this Vista that's opening up. If you, if you fundamentally can't talk about that with your partner um, and oftentimes people literally can't, they, their partner just says, I don't want to hear anything about it and they shut it down. And then, and so you like are, are left to go to chat boards or Facebook or, you know, call it high school friends or whatever it is to find that emotional support. There's a real risk there in my experience. And the risk is that over time you just start growing apart and you start relying less and less on your partner for emotional intimacy. You start relying on other people more and more. And for me, that can become a recipe for, just growing apart and 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 you know in my experience when infidelities start to happen it's when you've just stopped really looking to your core partner for your core emotional needs and you've gotten used to going to your friends or going to facebook or private things it can be a real risk and so um would, would you disagree with that natasha and margie do you have anything to add to that as well Oh, we can go to Natasha okay. first. I'm curious. No, I would I would agree with everything you've said. That's why I say 65 to 75 percent. So I do have you over the 50 yeah. percent mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that if Amy would have posited her question more as we can't talk about it at all, then I yeah. would have shared more concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I do think that that's again, if if you're in that position, that can be a short term transition phase that you need to allow your partner you know oftentimes what i have found is that faith transitioners have gone through a lot of thinking and a lot of processing privately before they even share anything with a partner and then are shocked when a partner has a negative response or feel you know so you kind of have to allow your partner some grieving time and sometimes they require boundaries like i'm not willing to look at i'm not willing to read i'm not willing to for a, and you can tolerate that for a certain amount of time, you know, maybe three to six months or even a year. But eventually, you have to be also saying, "This is not sustainable for me. This is not working. I need to be able to talk to you about these things if we're gonna, you know, be able to flourish as a couple." Um, but then also remembering that that's not the only thing. Sometimes faith transitioners they get very focused, hyper focused, right? So a lot of times, even from a, a, a more believing spouse that I feel is very nuanced and has dealt very well with their partner's transition. I'll often get the complaint of that's all they do all day long is listen. I mean, they're right. listening to podcasts 10 hours a day and I'm willing to listen to some of that with them, but I can't be that intensely involved. Right. And so that's what I mean by being able to, first of all, have balance 
because right. it can be so overwhelming of an experience if that's all you're thinking about and wanting to do and talk about with your spouse. Like, let's focus on the other things you still have in common, right? Other interests, that's listen to so other pod. If, if all you're doing is listening to Mormon podcasts, I would just challenge you to listen to something that's non-Mormon, for example, some of the time, right? So, so that your partner isn't so overwhelmed. And that can be true whether they're all in or even out with you. There can be one of you that's more interested in keeping that dialogue going. I love that point. That's such a great point. And one thing I was thinking about when you read the question was just if this is a unique situation, a unique response to the transition, or is it something that could be said overall for the relationship that mm -hmm. it really is a different need level for that sort of emotional intimacy? Or is it really honestly that she's feeling connected to in most ways, just probably mm -hmm. not in this area? That's something I would reflect on just mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, cause I think the approaches would be different. Well, and John, you and I have presented a lot together on intimacy, right? Yeah. And this idea that you can only really have the type of intimacy a partner is willing to share with you. So you know, you can have the best of intentions, the best communication skills, um, but you can only really enjoy the level of intimacy that a partner is willing to give. And so, yeah, at some point it does become kind of those conflicting values. You know, maybe I'm not getting a hundred percent of my emotional needs met. Maybe that's an unrealistic expectation. Maybe mm -hmm. I can accept the the ways that my partner does emotionally meet my needs and I can celebrate that and it's good enough. Maybe it's really concerning. Maybe I'm noticing myself going towards other people. Why is that? You know, why am I not, is that me? Am I not being, am I not, yeah. Um, am I not listening to the needs or requirements that my partner has for intimacy or is it my partner? Right. So these are very complex issues and require, you know, lengthy assessments <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, and, and the research supports that because most people, you know, for as much as we talk down people who get divorced and we're like, Oh, that's the easy way out. You know, most people who get divorced have been thinking about it for yeah. eight to 10 years. Yeah. That's a long time to be processing whether or not this relationship is yeah. sustainable for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one more quick. Yes. And I, I like the 60, 40 ratio. Um, the thing that, the thing that catches me is a little bit of a caution to that is let's just say, 60% evolves around exercise and the kids and your finances and, you know, lots of other parts of your life that don't involve your core spirituality and morality. Um, it, I guess I'm just saying that this faith crisis thing can become this, this, um, this sort of dinosaur in the basement. Uh, was there the dragon in the basement? I'm thinking my Harry Potter metaphor here a dragon in the basement that can grow and, uh, and burn the house down if it doesn't get addressed. So I don't recommend long-term avoidance of, of deeply talking about these issues. I've had great success as a coach um, taking a mixed faith couple, taking the religious language off of it, talking about fundamentals of emotional intimacy and, and what that looks like and so many times the, the non-believer doesn't necessarily even need the believer to abandon their faith. So many times they just want to be heard out. They just want to be listened to. They want to hear their believing partner say, I get it. Wow. Okay. I see why you've lost your faith. You're smart. I can see that for you, this was an act of integrity. And wow, if I saw the world from your point of view, I would leave too. Now, I don't, you know, from the believer, I don't, I see the world differently. My, those things aren't as important to me. Other things are important to me, so I'm going to stay. But man, I validate and hear and understand. If oftentimes if a couple can just get to that point, the non-believer can go, oh, okay, well, if, if church fulfills you, you do that and I'll support you and I don't need to go to church and you can support me. They can build a wonderful, fulfilling relationship without needing to agree. But I think it's usually more often than not essential that that conversation happens 
just so that the both both sides feel validated, listened to, and understood, which is separate from agreed with. Right. And on the same page. Yes. No, I would totally agree with that. And I would also say that it's not that um, I would say each each quadrant that I mentioned prior, you know, it's like sixty-five to seventy-five percent of your needs, and each of those quadrants right. Okay. Right. needs right. to be Got met, it. It. right? Because you can have, for example, Spiritual, really intellectual, right? Physical. Like you can have a really healthy relationship, um, like for example, our mixed orientation marriages. You know, they get a lot of flack if they divorce only for sex. Oh, so sex was the only thing that mattered to you right? Because otherwise you had a really good relationship. That quadrant matters, right? right. The, yeah. the, the physical mm-hmm. um, intimacy matters. And it's, and if you're not getting your needs met in that quadrant, that's really, that's right. significant. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. I think we may have talked about this a bit. Um, part three was the protection model versus intimacy model. Do you feel like we already covered that? Or do you want to say something more about that, Natasha? No, I think I'd like to say something about it. I think that it's a good way to frame it. I think we have, it goes along with many of the things that we've talked about, but to frame it specifically in that sense that, again, we have been through our Mormon heritage, but also our romance culture heritage. We've been taught that oftentimes intimacy is about uh, loving and caring for you and protecting you. And, and especially with that rhetoric, like I was talking about before for um, male Mormon males, you know, to protect the woman's feelings and all of those things. And so the problem with that is that um, much of what is going to hurt you is me. And so if I'm protecting you from the things that will hurt you about me, well then guess what that engenders that engenders secrecy and that engenders maybe shame or repression or, you know, like we're saying, not talking about issues. Oh, I could never tell my spouse that that would rock their world, right? Or I could never tell them of a sexual fantasy or I could never tell them about my real ideas about my faith or because that would be so dramatic for them and so hurtful for them. So I'll just keep it to myself. Or that I masturbate or that I looked at porn a little bit or whatever. All of these many ways, many, many ways. Or financially, I spent money, as you know, that I wouldn't want them to know about or there's many, many ways that we hold secret our behavior or our thoughts or our ideas from our partner, from this idea of I'm trying to protect you. Right. Um, and that comes oftentimes, sometimes from loving intention. Sometimes it just comes from fear. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. It's scary to be able to really open myself up to that level. I, I probably am somewhat correct that they would be hurt and maybe they would leave me or maybe it would cause, you know, this huge distress in our relationship. And, and I'm not even saying that at times that isn't even indicated. I'm not saying that nobody should do this. I'm, I'm just saying that we need to be aware when Mm -hmm. we are in protection style intimacies versus intimacy style intimacies, which really for me, the best metaphor of that, is the biblical thing, right? Like you will be naked with one another, naked. You know, that's not just take off your clothes. That's I'm taking off my emotional walls. I'm taking off my, like I'm presenting myself to you, right? Right. And so it's interesting to me how we do that physically, often in ways that are very sacred and personal, but it's much harder oftentimes to denude emotionally. And that is really where I think emotional intimacy comes from and what you can tolerate and what the other person can tolerate. And sometimes you're in a system where you can't tolerate much and you kind of know if I denude emotionally, they probably are going to leave. What am I going to do financially? What are the kids going to do? So I mean, I understand why people don't do this, (laughs) but at least we want to be cognizant that Mm -hmm. protection style intimacy versus intimacy style intimacy are two different things. Yeah. I, I, did you have something to say about that? Well, I was going to say, so would you go as far to say that the protection model then has some costs to it then some pretty heavy costs? Oh, I think it has huge costs. Yeah. One of them, one of them mainly being personal authenticity and secondly being relational intimacy. But I understand why that sometimes that happens. I mean, I have to challenge myself in ways, you know, that I'm like, am I really opening myself up 
completely yeah. here. I can feel very much for that. And I also am noticing as you were talking that, you know, really what is lost is sort of this idea of trust because by disclosing and being vulnerable, there is this sort of inherent exchange there that you're, uh, there's an assumption that you are trusting the person that they actually can. And I really love that because it allows at least the chance for a growth model. It's not sh in, like you can't be sure. You can't you know, control what the partner will do, but at least you've done your part, you know, hopefully in a really sensitive way to kind of be on this sort of growth model of how large is our love? How large can it go? What can connection mean for us amidst being really scared to show these darker you know, parts of ourselves that we feel shame around. What would you say about that? Well, really, I love that because it requires a redefinition of trust. Mm -hmm. We often hold trust in the context of behavioral compliance. Right. And now all of a sudden I'm telling you, maybe like you said, I masturbated or I had an affair or I no longer believe the way we used to believe, right? Or these all feel like betrayals. Right. And oftentimes it's interesting when I'm working with infidelities and such that people will say, well, yeah, now I can't trust you. Um, and that, you know, it's different, of course, if somebody's caught versus somebody comes forward with information. But for those that are, that are coming forward with information, I'm like, that's, they have trusted you with something pretty heavy here, right? So how are we going to redefine what trust looks like? Is right. trust that I'm going to trust that you're always going to act in ways that will never hurt me? Right. Or that you're always, you're never going to think in ways that would never hurt me. And that goes back to that mythology of I belong to you or you belong to me, right? We're going to meet all of each other's needs. When, and most of your real struggles in life, if you're in a long-term relationship, will come from your, from your partner. <laughs> Right. I think we have this idea that oh, all the trials will come from the outside in and we as a celestial couple, we will, you know, face all together. Right. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah. wait, you're, you're kind of the person that's my exactly. biggest problem. You're the problem. <laughs> you're the problem. <laughs> it's true. And so, so it's redefining trust. And, and I think in intimacy style marriages, the trust is about, I'm going to really tell you who I am. I'm really going to get naked in front of you. Whereas the trust and protection style marriages is I'm going to act and think and behave in a way that lets you feel comfortable. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause if you're, if you're hiding who you are and what you're about, then you're, you're not actually, you know, it's not a relationship with you in it, right? That's right. Your partner has a relationship with someone that's not you. Or so, a part of you. Right. Right. Exactly. Part of you or right. not all of you. And so, um, that sort of core personal authenticity allows you to fully be in the relationship. Um, but the second, I, I just want to echo what you said, that vulnerability, that difficult conversation, that stuff that you're most scared about um, can be the thing that provides the vulnerability, which I always say is the gasoline to the engine of intimacy. When, you know, I, the, I'll, I'll disclose something really, really sort of personal and uh, that some people would say shameful. I remember when I first told Margie, admitted to her that I uh, had masturbated sometimes during our marriage. Um, uh, I, I felt super embarrassed and shamed. And this was like 20 years into our marriage. Uh, I, you know, if, I, if you don't mind me sharing, Margie cried. Um, but what was beautiful, you know, that was hard and it was awkward and it sucked. Um, what was beautiful was what happened on the other side of that. Because instead of like, you know, keeping the Band-Aid on, uh, once that was kind of ripped off, it allowed us to have this conversation about, well, what are your sexual needs? You know, what, what are your sexual needs? Is there a way that we can meet each other's needs directly? So that there isn't necessarily a need for, you know, for you to meet those needs on your own. Not that there's anything wrong with meeting the needs on your own, but I, I, I can tell you from personally, pretty much all the time I'd prefer to be with Margie than meet my own needs if given a choice. That's just how I am. And so having that difficult conversation led to a conversation where we could talk about that. Also, for me, 
my interest in um, that sort of stuff diminished significantly once the shame and the secrecy element was taken away. And so once I knew that Margie just loved me no matter what, and that, you know, maybe that wasn't her perfect ideal of what our relationship would be about, but that if I did that, I was still loved and embraced and accepted and wasn't shamed about it, all of a sudden I was less interested in doing that um, as much. And again, not that that's forbidden in our relationship or that it should even be bad. I'm just saying that there was a lot of magic that happened, a lot of growth that happened for us once we just talked about it. And most of the growth happened for me not sitting in this place of secret, isolated shame and secrecy and hiding. The sunshine became this beautiful antiseptic for us. Um, and then I'll just say just really quickly, Natasha, you may want, either of you may want to trail on that. Oftentimes we've got this Band-Aid and we don't want to pull it off. And so instead of having a little bit of pain right now by pulling it off, we subject ourselves to this prolonged chronic and sometimes ultimately way more severe pain later on by avoiding the discussion of the difficult topic than the pain or difficulty that we would have had if we had just talked about it right up front early on. Um, and so don't, don't sort of trade a little bit of pain now or even a lot of pain now for a massive amount of pain and sometimes, you know, we can go a bridge too far over time. My suggestion is, if you're going to err, err on the side of full disclosure earlier versus waiting too long for more catastrophic pain or irreparable pain down the road. Any, any reactions to that? Well, I was just going to say as well, the way I remember it too, when you came into that conversation, your fear was really high. His fear was really high that I was going to like leave him or if, if, we, if I stayed in the marriage, there would be this, this judgment I had about him being shameful or having done that I just wouldn't shake and it would affect how I treated him or how I looked at him or how I viewed him. And the irony and what I think is most healing about that is how would we have known about our love, like how it would work if he hadn't disclosed it so that I could say, oh, hon, I, I like, I really, I love you. I remember in that moment and part of the crying honestly was like an innocence. Like I think I sensed in myself this sort of control piece or an innocence, uh, not having information kind of piece. But more than that, it was that I sensed how much he was grieving over it, how stressed he was, how, and I felt like how long has he been carrying this alone versus sharing it. And so these are all, I think, really important, beautiful uh, gifts that come from having a really, really difficult conversation. And in the meantime, I was able to look, really educate myself. I was, got very interested, got very, I mean, I grew up with my dad as a mental health professional. So I didn't have, uh, he was always very uh, liberal and very healthy about um, things. So it's not like I had a very um, dramatic response or judgment on my own, but it really did make me kind of take it in, take it on myself and say, I want to learn about this, actually. I really want to find out for myself and so that I can be a real partner in a healthy paradigm with my husband in this way. So, yeah, Natasha. No, I think, um, thank you for sharing all that personal stuff, because I think oftentimes those kinds of stories can really make a difference when they are personal. I think that there's this conflict, this constant tension of what I call kind of the safety wheel, right? Or the, the cycle of safety, because on the one hand, it's like, I want to be the kind of spouse where you can tell me everything. And I want you to trust me and tell me, tell me, tell me. Right. And then all of a sudden we're told something we're like, <laughs> don't tell me that, <laughs> don't, you know, I don't want to deal with that problem. Right. And so that's a, that's a, a hard thing when we want intimacy, but then we also have our own reactions to what real intimacy looks like, which means we're going to have to be 
uh, comfortable addressing some uncomfortable situations, right, and discussions. And so I really try to normalize that for my couples that you, you can't really expect your partner to be a complete safe space, kind of like how I started the discussion, like, oh, I'm so glad you're telling me that you were masturbating in secret, <laughs> you know, the, our entire marriage, you know, it's like, you might cry, or you might be sad, or there might be feelings of betrayal, or, um, but that with that, you can say, well, you know, thanks for telling me this, and yeah, I'm having, I'm really hurt, and, but let's figure this out, you know, so it's kind of like the cycle of, like I can tell you something, you don't need to be 100% safe, but if you could be like 70% safe, that would be really wonderful as far as me being able to trust you again with more information. Oftentimes people try, like if it would have been different between the two of you and Margie would have had, you know, gone into like a three month depression cycle and, you know, really, uh, you know, kicked you out of the bedroom or, you know, if it would have been much more rigid of a response, then you may not have been comfortable coming back and saying something more in the future. Right. And so we want to be careful on both ends. Right. Yeah. Like in the Mormon context, a wife catches a husband masturbating or vice versa. And it's like, we have to go tell the bishop. And now maybe you don't take the sacrament. And now you're not a worthy priesthood holder. And now I'm ashamed to have you as the father of my children. And now you need to go to a 12 step program because you are an addict. And that spiral can be devastating individually and to a relationship. Yeah. And so you can understand she's been taught to have that response oftentimes, right? That's the right thing to do. That's how she's going to help her husband is to have that type of rigid response. Again, it's not because she's malicious usually. And then he oftentimes will go right back into secrecy and protection style marriage mode because what other options are there? That's why I'm not trying to shame protection style marriages. There's, there's real reasons. I mean, think about even if you're a woman in a domestic violence type of situation and, and you don't want to have even the possibility of joint custody, you may be very, um, you may be very motivated to stay in a protection style marriage for many years even though you know it comes at great personal cost, because at least in your perspective, whether it's true or not, the cost of going anything else is too high. I have a hard question for you, and this just came out of the blue. Okay. I once had someone tell me, if you, if you cheat, in, in terms of infidelity, if you tell the spouse you're doing it for yourself, you're not doing it for the spouse. In other words, if you cheat and then you, you know, let's just say you decide not to cheat again, do you disclose or not? I've, I've heard it say there's, I've heard someone say there's no possible benefit to tell your spouse you've cheated if you've stopped and you're not going to do it again, because it's just going to add all this complexity and distress. Um, and it'd be more to do it, to get it off your chest or make yourself not feel guilty, but don't pretend that you're actually doing it for your spouse because you're really just going to wreck their lives. What would you say to that if somebody said they're protecting their spouse from that information? So the older I get, (laughs) the less comfortable I am with any statement that's a wide sweeping brush, you know, like it's never this or it's always that, or I think that so much relies on context. You know, there's very few things that I'm willing to hang my pretty rigid stances on one of them being addiction counseling for sexuality. But um, other than that, (laughs) I'm pretty, and I'm, and I'm even open to that changing if the research supports it. Right. But I'm just saying, yeah, I, I think I would have had much more rigid stances as a marriage therapist earlier in my career around Mm -hmm. statements like that, where you always should disclose because otherwise, you know, you're just keeping things secret in a marriage and that's never good. Um, I've, I've, listen to many stories where I feel like that was actually the wise thing to do, to you know, not, um, to, not to not say, to not disclose. And then there are other re- relationships where I would say that's absolutely impeding on the intimacy and a lot of Esther Perel's work around in, uh, infidelity and how working through infidelity can really actually get you to a whole new level of intimacy. If your marriage survives, yes, there is a risk. Your marriage will not survive a disclosure, right? And why oftentimes people will not disclose but um, oftentimes that can be that can be the work that really propels your relationship to a whole new level, kind of like what you're discussing with your masturbation disclosure, right? So um, 
it's very tricky. And I think we as mental health professionals should get out of the business of telling people you should or should not do whatever in any given situation without really just allowing for the exploration and the context of their particular situation. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Well, we're kind of winding up uh, <laughs> today's conversation. Um, I'm really, really happy with the, the level of engagement. We've had great comments and, and discussion from our Facebook listeners. I really want to thank those who joined us on Facebook Live um, to participate. We have a lot of uh, points in there for our show notes. So for uh, Amy and Cody, if you're listening, uh, we'll make sure to comb uh, the comments for the links to put in the show notes so that people can have those as resources. But, but Natasha, I, uh, I think this has been a great first stab at some important topics around healthy marriage. So um, any, any sort of summation you want to do today for our listeners to kind of summarize or to leave a final point or perspective for today? Before we well, did I, did I even cover the five points that I gave you? I can't even remember what the five points the last were. Two are. The last Could two we were the last two? avoiding Another power one. differentials and ownership rhetorics. And then the final one was challenging the rhetoric of codependence. Which I love those. So can we come, oh. you come back? Can we discuss those? I don't know. Yeah, and I do think we did discuss them. I mean, the parent-teacher missionary was definitely part of that power right. differential stuff yeah. of avoiding those. And the codependency was really my comments around not being islands. I, I really feel like we shame women in particular. I don't, I don't know many men who are told they're codependent. <laughs> We, 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 we tell men they're sex addicts and we tell women they're love addicts, right? right. <laughs> like, so oh true. my gosh. So, anyway, cause you know, men who are emotionally needy, that's beautiful. And women who are sexually promiscuous, that's wonderful too. Right. <laughs> so right. I'm just like mind blown. Anyway, I, I just think that that codependency language, yes, there are times when we need to learn how to self soothe and learn how to not always count on another person for our own emotional regulation. And I think that's what most codependent literature is about. But I feel like our culture often takes that to that extreme of, I've got to figure myself out and then I can have a relationship with other people. And I'm just like, in what world can you do that? You know, I just don't know how you do that. So I think that that's a constant meld of figuring ourselves out, figuring out our relationships. And, and that's constantly interwoven in, in everyday experiences for ourselves, right? So as far as closing thoughts, I just, if you've stuck in with us, I mean, thank you. And I think that these types of relationships that we call marriage or long-term, whatever you want to whatever type of long-term relationship you're in our wonderful crucibles wonderful and awful crucibles of self-learning and all these values that we think about boy no better place to live your values than in the context of a long-term relationship <laughs> so, <laughs> whether you end up staying with that person for 50 years or five years or however long those relationships last in your life, they're all significant and they all have a lot to teach us. Beautiful. Well, Natasha Helfer Parker, we love, uh, we always love having you on the show. We're going to have you back. I think it's next week to continue this discussion. I really want to encourage not one person emailed a comment or question to Mormon stories at gmail.com. We're a shame-free podcast, but uh, <laughs> what we would love to, to see would be to have people email in some questions and some scenarios, and that way we can look at it, we can plan for it. If there are issues, topics, faith transition, post-Mormons, um, anything, please uh, message us with your situation, your question, uh, again, mormonstories.gmail.com, and we'll prepare those scenarios and questions and topics for our next discussion. We really want this to be uh, interactive. So we want to invite you guys to join us next week. If you want part two of this discussion uh, to, to make your marriage great, you might need more than one episode of a podcast. <laughs> Is that true? It's likely. Is that fair? <laughs> likely. Okay. So, um, so please consider joining us next week. Please consider sending us your messages. Um, Natasha, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they find you? 
uh, through my website, symmetrysouls.com. So symmetry, S-O-L-S.com is the best way to reach me. Um, my, yeah, I think that's probably the best way. Okay. Giving out personal information. <laughs> All right. So uh, check out Natasha Elford Parker's uh, Symmetry Solutions. Um, again, I just want to thank everyone who donates to the Open Stories Foundation to make this possible. I have to make this plug every time. We rely on your support to, to support the nonprofit. We're financially transparent. Uh, we, we are responsible with your funds and all the money goes towards the mission, which is supporting people in religious transition. So please take the time if you've benefited from these episodes and you don't contribute, just go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, set up a 10 or 20 or whatever, $50 recurring donation. And just know that that money will keep this alive and allow us to keep providing this information, not just for you, but for people who come after you. So it's a worthy cause and it's tax deductible. So I want to thank uh, uh, Cody Layton, who is our technical podcast producer. I want to thank Amy Grubbs, who's our director of operations. I want to thank Margie, who's wonderful. I want to thank John, who's awesome. And, and uh, we both want to thank Natasha. And Natasha. Who is well, and I, I second all the donation stuff. I mean, the stuff that the Open Stories puts out, all the stuff you put out, the stuff I put out, and all of our other colleagues. I mean, I hope people understand this is very valuable resources. It's so valuable for me, even in my work, to be able to direct somebody to a podcast or to a, a written piece that's been done by the Open Stories Foundation. And it's really very valuable resources that are really just available for free. And, but it doesn't come for free. Yeah. yeah. Check out Mormon Mental Health Podcast. Yep. Donate to Mormon Mental Health Podcast. Check out Mormon Sex Info. Uh, great stuff there. Uh, yeah. So thanks again, everybody. We're excited for next week. Sure, Natasha. love you. And Natasha. See you we'll next week. Okay, we'll see you. And listeners, <laughs> please do send your questions or scenarios so that we can address them on the show. All right. Love you guys. Thanks, everybody. Uh, talk to you soon. Take care.